number 51. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Homesteads and Homeschools podcast. Uh, that great booming voice in the beginning that told you it was episode 51 was not lying. It is. It is episode 51, which means show notes are at homesteadsandhomeschools.com slash 051. My guest today was uh, Mr. Jeremy Chambers from Independence Acres Homestead. Uh, he does it all. He's got the uh, the homesteading, the homeschooling, and does some home churching. And uh, there's a lot to talk about there, but uh, we kind of focused on rabbits. Uh, I have a, a love of rabbits. We raised them in Vermont uh, since moving to Georgia. I have yet to do that. Something about the heat kind of uh, leaves me a little little tentative. Not, not entirely sure I want to get into that, but it is possible. We're going to get right into it, um, and I'm going to have him tell you all about his his stuff and what's going on. And uh, There is a little, little bonus segment at the end of the show today if you are interested in hearing about Jeremy's home churching and, and what that looks like and how that how that works, check it out over at patreon.com slash the Liberty Hippie, and you can find it there. Uh, it, it's very interesting. It's um, something that I, I won't lie and say that uh, I was totally on board with um, coming into it, but it did kind of shed a whole lot of light and makes a whole lot more sense when you actually hear it explained rather than just just a word, just a word. But anyway, we're going to talk about rabbits, and then if you want, you can find the bonus afterwards. So let's get into it. Uh, let's go sow those Liberty Seeds with Mr. Jeremy Chambers. My guest today is... Mr. Jeremy Chambers from up there in in cold, chilly, frozen, whatever you want to call it, uh, Michigan, on the Independence Acres Homestead. Um, yeah, so Jeremy, thank you for for coming on. Thanks for taking the time out today. I, I appreciate it. So, no, thank you for the invitation. This is a wonderful opportunity. I wouldn't miss it. Yeah, no problem, man. So, uh, yeah, you're you're up there in in Michigan. Is that? Are you from Michigan? I actually am not originally from Michigan. Um, my wife is from the Detroit area. I uh, grew up in, uh, in here, uh, in, the, in the Michigan, you know, Detroit, Michigan area. Um, we actually met at uh, Bible College down in Texas. I'm originally from Virginia. Uh, we got married in Virginia and then moved up here about a year and a half after we got married to take on some job opportunities. And um, it's been quite a whirlwind the last 20 years uh, since we got married but it's been well worth it good yeah and it's been uh the cold hasn't hasn't sent you packing yet you know i, I do like michigan i like having all four seasons but uh, unfortunately we do see mostly two seasons here that would be uh, road construction and winter yeah yeah i i the amount of tires i lost on on potholes and stuff in, in Vermont. And all right. So did you guys, um, you, you're, you got a little homestead going now. Did you guys grow up with that at all? Did you have some of that in your background or? So when I was growing up, so like I said, I'm originally from Virginia before I moved to Michigan, but before that we were in Colorado. Uh, my father had, um, chickens, ducks, goats, uh, as I was growing up. And then when we moved to Virginia, he was in the construction trade, so we did a lot of moving uh, and had to follow the work. So then when we moved to Virginia, we ended up um, about five to six years with, with no animals, just a, a small garden. Uh, and then we ended up renting a home on a dairy farm. And so I kind of fell in love with farming at that point. It wasn't um, something I considered even doing it as a career, uh, looked into going to college for, uh, for an ag degree. But it just didn't work out. Uh, instead, I went a different route and ended up going to uh, Bible College down in Texas, where I met my wife. Uh, and she is a city girl through and through. Um, when we first met, she knew how to make spaghetti and grilled cheese <laughs> and you know a couple other things. Uh, but you know, very um, meat and potatoes kind of person. So I kind of opened up her eyes to some other culinary delights. Um, and then from there, uh, we, we moved up to Michigan, uh, lived in the city, 
um, really had no desire to start a farm or a homestead or anything of that nature. Um, but our, our journey towards homesteading actually started as more of the survivalist prepper group uh, kind of, kind of uh, mentality, um, preparing for the future, not necessarily you know, for catastrophic end of the world as we know it kind of thing, but just more of a being ready for the low times. So we started doing some food storage, and this is while we were still in the city. Started doing some food storage, had a small garden, uh, learned how to can. I had canned with my mother growing up, but I'd never actually done it myself. So we started doing a lot of canning. And uh, then the market crash hit in 2008. I, I know that a lot of the country wasn't affected by that too much, uh, as much as the Detroit, Michigan area. Uh, you know, the automotive industry is uh, w was the kind of headed that crash a little bit. So that took our housing market down and um, we lost about 80% equity in the home we were living in and owned at the time. Um, it, was, it was a very difficult time. And of course, at this time, we were very happy we had prepared some food and we had, had, had begun looking at, at ways to, to be ready for these downtimes. And w when the market really started to fall, we decided it was time to get out of the city. And um, we began looking uh, in the agricultural areas north of us. And we still had this prepper mentality. So we were looking for, you know, a big basement, you know, some woods. Uh, and then eventually, our, once we found the house and we started living here, we got chickens, the garden got bigger. And I realized we were no longer preppers or survivalists. We had become homesteaders. We were uh, trying to eke out as much of our existence out of the land we lived on as possible. And, and that's the difference between farming and homesteading. F uh, farming is usually done for a profit. And homesteading is usually done for your own personal self-sufficiency. Yeah. How, how was that making, like, I don't know, going from that sort of more the, the prepping side to actually kind of, you know, working, working the land and stuff, how was that transition? Was it something you were like, just woke up one day and were like, hey, look at, look at what we've done, how, how we've come, or how did... When did you kind of put that all together and notice that, hey, we're, we're kind of doing this thing a little bit more now? <laughs> uh, it was probably after we got our 20th chicken. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, something just clicked inside of me and it said, listen, you know, we, we came up here with the purpose of, you know, creating a, a kind of a bug out location for friends in case things got a little more difficult. And then we realized that we were learning things and it was time for us to begin transitioning from uh us and ours to community. And, and that's where that transition began to come from prepping to homesteading, because there's, there's a big community element in homesteading uh, where we're going from uh, doing for ourselves and then begin to, to, to learn so that then we can teach others and do for others. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of it. Is that, I mean, is that how you have learned a bit or have you done a bunch of reading and stuff beforehand? Did you have somebody to kind of, you know, lean on a little bit? That's a, that's a good question. So I am what you would consider obsessive compulsive about certain things. Uh, when I become interested in something, I will um, in, immerse myself in an environment where I can learn about it. Uh, so it, it, it happened, uh, obviously, with the, the prepping and survivalist mentality. But then when it became to, to the homesteading mentality, it became more of, okay, what can we do to be as self-sufficient as possible. And now my father was, like I said, a carpenter, you know, in constructions growing up. So he had taught me a lot of carpentry skills, you know, basic woodworking skills. Um, but I had never processed an animal in my life. Um, and I began watching YouTube videos, YouTube videos, are, you know, <laughs> it's a great source really. Yeah. Um, and so from there, and it just became, uh, like I said, a little bit of an obsession, learning more about gardening, how to improve my soil conditions, what I can do to, uh, that might ruin my soil conditions. And um, just individual skills from, you know, animal husbandry uh, for small animals, um, animal genetics, um, breeding, uh, you know, all of these things. And then, you know, coming into uh, heirloom vegetables, uh, the difference between heirloom and uh, your hybrid varieties. And, and so it just became a, a, a little bit of an obsession for me to, to, to learn and to study as much as I could. Yeah, I I. I I know that well. I know that well. <laughs> I think I think a lot of people in this sort of little genre of life, uh, that's that's uh, they know they know how that goes. Exactly. But, um, we've we've all binge watched YouTube videos. I'm sure 
Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's funny. You just, it's like you watch your little kids do it. Like they'll, you know, start with a Thomas the train video or something. And and before you know it, they're watching like some locomotive video that, you know, has, but you do the same thing, whether it's, uh, you know, butchering deer or breaking down cows or whatever. I, we all, all done it, but exactly. How do you guys, um, in terms of gardening and stuff, do you, do you garden through the winter? Do you go through the winter at all? Do you have any stuff like that? That's the biggest drawback to living in Michigan is the the length of our growing season. Um, this is only really our second year of being successful at gardening. So we haven't done too much into transitioning through the winter. Uh, I have been researching some, uh, you know, indoor uh, growing methods. Uh, haven't quite gotten to the point where I'm ready to to dip my toes into it yet. We are going to be starting some seeds here pretty soon. Um, actually, for hemp. So that's, uh, that's oh, one of the things. You. One of the things we've been um, doing a little bit of research and work on up here on our homestead uh, with the, some recent laws that passed and uh, that came uh, across a voter referendum uh, last uh, t- in 2018. Uh, it legalized the growing of up to 12 cannabis plants uh, uh, at, at a household and. Well, you know, luckily hemp is a member of the cannabis plant family. So with that, um, I jumped on to the, uh, jumped in, you know, t- whole body. I didn't even dib- right. dabble my toes into it. <laughs> Went out and b- got some seeds and, you know, planted the 12 seeds right away. And I'm really happy with uh, some of the products we were able to get. The rabbits absolutely love the hemp plant and it's a very nutritious and healthy plant for them. Uh, the seed is very high in protein uh, and the flower itself has a you know a lot of uh, medicinal properties, and so we were really excited to be able to grow that. So that's really the only thing we're going to be trying to grow through the winter here, um, because anything I start too soon is it's just going to die before it can get in the ground. Yeah, I remember that a little bit um, up north. You know, the the tomatoes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Just you could get them in and they'd grow, but they just, by the time you could actually get them outside, they were so scraggly and it just yeah. you know they just get really leggy. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So with I'm curious with the hemp, do you um, do you guys use it uh, for anything other than like animal feed? Do you use it for like, do you guys use the, the seeds and stuff and the, have you gotten that far into it? You know, I have, uh, while we were growing the plants, uh, all the trimmings, I would um, eat a little bit of the trimmings myself. Uh, I actually, actually really enjoy the flavor. Um, certain varieties, of course, some are more skunky than others, just like uh, other cannabis varieties. Um, but the, the one that we chose uh, to grow uh, is, very, is a, it's a high CBD variety. Uh, so we, we chose that specifically for its, its medicinal properties. Uh, and then all the byproducts, we tried to use every bit of it. We used right. the, the roots to, uh, create a, uh, uh, an infused oil. we did the same thing with the flowers, all of the stocks, we're going to be saving them throughout the, the, the seasons, obviously at 12 plants at a time, we can't get too many stocks at a time, but right. we're going to try our hand at uh, creating some fiber. Uh, some hemp fiber, and then all of the leaves we're trimming down, and we're creating a hemp hay to feed to our rabbits. Now it's not a lot, but it's it's something that we can give it's them. Something, the yeah. yeah, and they love it. Good deal. That's uh, I keep I keep wanting to try that down here, but I'm not uh, not entirely sure how it all will will work in Georgia. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can understand. But, uh, all right, so you got I, I, you mentioned you have chickens. How many chickens do you have to now? Um, right now we've kind of modulated our chickens a little bit we, we we've we've kind of trimmed them down we've only got about 16 laying hens in a single rooster right now um if it were up to me i'd have a hen house big enough to house about 80 of them because i you know i just love the variety of, yeah. of egg colors i love the variety of of chickens there's just so many out there um you know the different colorations and feather patterns it's 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 yeah it's dangerous it's it dangerous. is it's very dangerous. <laughs> chicken math chicken math is a real thing so do you do you sell the eggs or do you what do you guys do with all the eggs? So for us, we focus on um, eating them as much as we can ourselves. Um, yeah, I've got three boys in the house: uh, a sixteen-year-old, okay. an eleven-year-old, and an eight-year-old. And you know, we can go through a lot of eggs. Um, what we do have, I do sell to some people at work, um, or we just give them away to to families within our uh, homeschool community or within our home our homestead community. So, gotcha. Yeah, that's. Uh, 
we've tried to sell eggs before and I remember selling eggs as a kid and it just, the prices you could get for the eggs, um, it just didn't, uh, it didn't add up. You're better off eating them or something, but it's, it's very true. I mean, our goal is never to, I mean, like I said, our goal isn't to make money on our homestead. Uh, the, you know, the goal is to self-sufficiency and to provide an outlet for education for others. So, All right. so, um, and I know you mentioned you had some rabbits there. Just um, a few. Just a few. How, how long have you guys been doing the, the rabbits for? Uh, we're starting our fifth year with rabbits. Um, they kind of just fell into our lap one day. Um, almost literally. Uh, we, <laughs> I was actually out in California uh, working on an autonomous vehicle demonstration with the, uh, the automotive company I work for. And I had a member of our um, previous prepping community give us a call and say, hey, I, I found somebody who's selling some rabbits really cheap. What do you think? And of, of course, my first mind, uh, the, the first thought in my mind was, what would I do with a rabbit? So then I began researching, uh, as I would, spent many sleepless nights in my hotel room out in California researching um, how I could use rabbits on the homestead, um, the, the breed of rabbit that was being offered to us at a, at a great price. And I just immediately fell in love with the idea of having rabbits on our homestead. They, I... That's the one thing I miss. I, I do. I, I miss having rabbits. Um, I, I think I can have rabbits down here. You can it's just the heat in the summer. Um, Absolutely. you gotta be a little bit more, more careful. Um, yeah. sure. I know as, as you know, like they, they don't mind the cold. They, they kind of prefer the cold. They love uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, uh, all right. You've had them for about five years and, uh, what, what are you working with? What kind are you working with? So our primary focus was the Californian breed. Uh, main reason was because they were a developed uh, in the early 1920s as a commercial meat rabbit. So they're bred specifically for the purpose of having you know fast grow rates, large litter sizes, good menta- uh, good temperament for being you know k in a caged environment and being handled on a regular basis. Uh, and they have a, a very nice you know white fur, which uh, is highly desirable by people who are looking to. Uh, harvest and tan rabbit furs. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, easy, easy to die. Easy to Ab- die. Absolutely, they can make it look like a leopard pelt if they want to. So. <laughs> All right. And um, so, how how many are you up to now? So we cur- we currently have six breeding does and uh, two Californian bucks within our our breeding herd. We've introduced a couple other. Um, what we'd call meat mutts, uh, which just kind of have uh, some genetics of the Flemish giant, Californian, and Rex, which are all a, a very prolific rabbits in our area, just trying to, you know, possibly introduce some different color variations, uh, some different body types or temperament, because um, it, it's important that we breed for, uh, because we're raising specifically for meat production, uh, body type, temperament, are, are our biggest concerns. Um, and so we're not going to, when I'm not going to, you know, be breed rabbits that are uh, having bad attitudes or they don't <laughs> grow fast enough, or they just, you know, um, we don't breed to standard of perfection, uh, for breed, be breed perfection. It's something that, um, I, I kind of determined a long time ago, you know, pedigree didn't matter to me because the, the, the nastiest, ugliest, poor bodied rabbit can be pedigreed. Uh, but it, that doesn't mean that it's going to have you know a good temperament or nice body type. Yeah, it, can, it it's tough because it's one of those kind of trade offs, you know, where you can you can turn around and you can sell you know a, a pedigreed American rabbit for you know whatever, and then exactly. But at the same time, if it's just because it fits that standard, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be what you want for your plate or your freezer. Um, exactly. You know, and so it's kind of, what do you do? Which do you, do you pick? And yeah, I don't know. So do you, do you put most of yours in the, in the freezer then, or do you sell, sell some of the, the kits? Um, so we do put about 250 pounds of meat into our freezer every year. And we're always, you know, cycling through that. Um, and that's just using our main three breeding does. Um, we were able to put, a lot of meat into the freezer and, and we're very conservative breeders. I, I, I like to give my does plenty of resting time between litters in order to make sure that, you know, we're not wearing them out. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, a fatigued mom can, 
um, be temperamental with her babies and uh, really cause some problems. So we, we really don't want to wear out our does. And so we're very conservative on our breeding. Um, and then I do hold back some of the better stock and we do uh, try to sell it locally. Californians, uh, while they are a very uh, well-known meat rabbit breed, there's areas of the country where they're not as prolific. Uh, you really can't find them. Uh, like in Virginia, where my my, pa my parents live, um, we uh, we attend a conference down there uh, once a year for homesteaders. And, you know, I've always got people asking me, when, can you bring down some breeding stock? Can you bring down some breeding <laughs> stock? So I always try to keep the best of a, of a couple litters throughout the year and set them aside, get them tattooed and ready to go so that they can uh, be ready to to provide uh, breeding stock for uh, other homesteaders. Right on, right on. So do you, um, when you're picking the best of, of your litter um, and that sort of thing, then you're just, you're going on basically just looks and, and meat production and genetic lines that you have. You keep that all sort of on the computer somewhere or something? Well, unfortunately, I'm one of those people where I keep everything in my mind. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so that can cause a problem. I mean, I do keep notebooks and I keep records. Right. So the main thing that I'm looking at, if I'm going to be providing breeding stock or selling breeding stock to somebody else, is I'm going to be watching growth rates from two weeks to five weeks, and then from eight weeks to 12 weeks. Those are really the two, the two periods where they experience their largest amount of growth. And any rabbit that doesn't meet a certain requirement for me, usually will just go to the freezer. Um, you know, we're at by five weeks, I like to have a rabbit that's, uh, around two, two and a half pounds to, uh, to reserve for breeding stock. And then they must be five pounds or larger by 12 weeks. Okay. Uh, otherwise I won't certify them and sell them as breeding stock. Yeah. When do you, uh, when do you typically put them in the freezer? Well, it depends upon, well, number one, what season it is. Um, if I have rabbits born in November, they're going to be a little older before I process, um, because we don't have a place where we like to process indoors. I don't like doing it in the house and yeah. we don't have a, a heated area outside the house to do processing. So, uh, but ideally, uh, five pounds live weight or, um, 12 weeks is ideal, but usually it's between 12 and 16 weeks and also depends upon whether or not I feel that uh, the quality of the pelt on that particular rabbit is worth preserving. And if so, I'm going to, especially if it's a, a midsummer or a midwinter uh, processing, I will wait until they're pushing 20 to 24 weeks uh, in order to get a, a quality pelt to get tanned. Right. So you tan, you get your, your pelts tanned sometimes, some of them? Sometimes I do them myself. It just depends upon how ambitious I'm being uh, that particular <laughs> time. Um, but we're, we're trying to focus uh, on training ourselves and, and the people that we deal with rabbits to see them as more than just meat. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of potential in that whole carcass uh, from, you know, from ears to tail. And, and understanding the, uh, the possibilities and the potential with all of, of that has a, you know, has a chance to increase... Um, its value as a sustainable food source, but also as a, a little bit of extra income for the homestead. Yeah, they really, I, I love rabbits. Um, so many different levels. They just like, and it's so much easier to dress out a rabbit than it is a chicken. I, I do rabbits every day. hundred percent, hundred percent. I tell you, I, the last time I did a chicken was uh, about six years ago. I was stopped doing meat. I stopped doing meat chickens um, and like I said, once the idea and the concept of raising rabbits for meat came about, uh, I'm, I'm in it a hundred percent. Um, the processing time is easier. There's, you know, no need to scald, no need to pluck. Uh, and I can do a, a rabbit once every four minutes. Uh, once I get into the groove, uh, chickens just, mm -mm, they're just not there for me anymore. <laughs> well, I, 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 yeah, we just did a bunch of meat chickens and it, mm. it took a while, you know, and I, I was thinking back to when I was doing rabbits and you do, once you get down into that, that rhythm, once you get into the groove and you're just kind of going with it, it just flows. And but, uh, yeah, I mean, then you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm done. There's not more rabbits to do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, and, and one thing I like about rabbits is, you know, it can be done just about anywhere. Um, you know, like I said at the conference that we go to once a year, uh, I, I'll do a live uh, butchering demonstration in front of about 300 people. And um, the, for most of them, it's the first time they've ever seen a rabbit get processed. And uh, the comments afterwards, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it was that easy. Or, 
Um, where's the smell? Where's, you know, where's the noise? You know, and they're just absolutely amazed at, at how simple uh, a rabbit processing can be. And, uh, and that's part of our goal is just to, to help people realize um, the, the, the simplicity in, in rabbits and, and their value, uh, even nutritionally above mm -hmm. what a meat chicken is. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, especially, you know, if, if people are, are on strict diets, uh, you know, you know, calories, you know, it's a, a lower, lower calories per pound, um, higher protein than most chicken, fish, pork, lamb, you know, just about anything. It's, it's just a, it's, it's just a very nutritionally complete, you know, protein source. Uh, other than fats, that's that's the biggest concern with a lot of people is there's not enough fat. But in our North American diet, fat is not a problem. Uh, yeah, I was going to say for most of us, um, I don't think that's going to be a problem. But yeah, uh, yeah, not an issue. So um, I assume when you started doing rabbits, then did you have rabbit before then? Did you eat rabbit uh, prior to that, or was this kind of? <laughs> so that's a, that's a that's a good question. No, I had never had domestic rabbit in my life. I had had wild rabbit, um, which the North American wild rabbit cottontail is a, is a completely different species of rabbit than what we have domestically. Uh, all domestic rabbits are genetic descendants of the European rabbits that were brought over uh, for meat, uh, domestic meat production. Um, but uh, so, you know, wild rabbit has a little more of a gamey flavor, darker meat. Um, protein content is a little higher, but uh, vitamin and mineral content is usually a little lower. And it just tastes a little different. So, I'd had wild rabbit before, uh, and the first question my wife said when I presented the idea of raising rabbit stir was, well, what does it taste like? And I said, well, everybody says it tastes like chicken, right? <laughs> uh, she didn't believe me. So when I got back home from, uh, from that business trip, uh, even though technically she didn't know this, I had already committed to take the rabbits. Um, I said, well, before we really go jump into this, you know, uh, you know, we'll go into it all guns blazing. Let's, let's head down to the store and uh, let's buy one, you know, because there's a local meat market here that had some available. And uh, I was overwhelmed when we got into the store because there was, there was two types of rabbit. There was uh, raised and processed in the United States, and there was um, raised in the United States, processed in China, which that really threw me for a loop. Uh, and the raised in the United States, uh, raised and processed in the United States, it was, it was $11.99 a pound. I about, I about lost it. I'm like, I don't pay 11 I, I, that's like filet mignon prices for me. I'm like, you know, I'm, it was, it was a little too much. And then there was the, the processed in China one and I'm looking at it. They look the same, except it was like four ninety nine a pound. And you know, the, um, the cheapskate in me said, let's get that one. And my wife said, no, we're getting the one that was raised and processed in the United <laughs> States. So I said, yes, ma'am. So we got that one and I came home and we made chick we, well, we made rabbit cacciatore with it. And, uh, and it was amazing. Um, the kids loved it. My wife enjoyed it. Um, so we, we just, we said, yep, this, this is it. And then from there, we've just been doing what we can to adopt as many recipes into, uh, you know, using rabbit as possible. Um, you know, trying to develop some of our own using, uh, you know, basing it off of like a pork sausage recipe and make a rabbit sausage and, uh, you know, just trying to incorporate it into our diet. We'll have rabbit. Um, I'd like to have it more often, but you know, sometimes with my work schedule, my wife doesn't like to cook it. She's always afraid she's going to ruin it, um, which she doesn't. She hasn't ruined it yet, but you know, uh, so like that, uh, we just made um, Indian buttered rabbit this last Saturday and it was amazing. Good deal. So any, any, uh, any favorite recipes out there? If somebody wants, somebody's thinking about trying rabbit, what would you tell them to try it? How, how would you cook it? Ooh, okay. Well, there's, there's really, you you can't go wrong with just a good old Hassenpfeffer recipe. Um, Hassenpfeffer, that's German for rabbit and pepper. And that's, it, it's, it's a pretty basic recipe. You really can't screw it up. Um, but the, the other one that I would have to say, we've got two favorites. Um, the first uh, would be a mulligatani soup, which is a, an Indian curry soup. Uh, we like curry in this house, uh, in case you can't tell. It's a, and this is one of the ones I will make uh, during a, a rabbit processing class that we do. We do a, a hutch to hearty meal class. It's a full eight-hour class, raising rabbits, processing, and then we actually make a dish with some of the rabbits that we've processed. And um, we did make this mulligatani soup, and it's a, it's a curry-based soup. And it's just amazing. Just the, you know, it, it's, it's simple, but so hearty. Uh, and then the second one is a Greek Stefano stew. 
and and it is a it's a it's a, a wine based uh, stew with uh, rabbit and red onions. Uh, and you can serve it over like polenta or rice, and it just makes a a very rich and hearty meal. Uh, and those two have been some of the the favorites that we've have uh, have made for guests or uh, that we teach in our that we use in our classes. Good, yeah. I remember the the Hassan Pfeffer that was always fun to do. Um, so, what what class is this that you? Um... Is this something you do up in, in Michigan, or is this what you do down in when you go to this uh, conference? Yeah, so well, it's it's we kind of do it whenever. Um, <laughs> we're we are equal equal opportunity educators here. I, I don't care where you're at or what you're doing. Uh, if if we can figure out a time to to do it, you know, I'll go to Florida, I'll go to Georgia, I'll go to Texas, Tennessee, California, maybe not so much, but yeah, just kidding, Californians. I still love you guys. Um, uh, but uh, yes, our the focus. This was a, a class that was originally developed for uh, the conference that we go to. It's uh, uh, Homesteaders of America. It was a, a an organization actually, and then uh, this conference kind of was, was created an offshoot. This last year was the the third annual conference, and they have uh, hands on intensive classes. Uh, it's a, it's a Friday Saturday uh, convention, but the uh, on the Thursday before, they do a hands-on intensive class. They do a, a, a canning class, a sourdough bread making class. They've got a blacksmith that does a class. Uh, just a, a lot of great hands-on classes. And we were asked to do a um, a, a full day-long class on uh, rabbit raising. And I said, well, is it okay if I actually cook something too? Because I, it's great to tell people how to raise rabbits, but how do you use it in your everyday cooking and life? And and so that's what we do. We do a, a the morning class. Uh, it's a, it's a first three hours is all uh, just getting your rabbitry set up, getting uh, everything that you need lined up, choosing breeding stock, um, and then we do a uh, two rabbit processing demonstration so that uh, they can you know really get in close. I show I do one really as fast as I can so that they can see how quick and easy it is. And then I have everybody gather around and we go through and I, I take it nice and slow. I point out each and every part of the inside of the rabbit so that they can understand how to identify health issues if the rabbit you know has uh, you know spots on the lungs or spots in the liver. Um, and then from there, uh, right after lunch, we go through and we um, make two meals or two dishes for a meal using the rabbits that we processed uh, before lunch. And then uh, each of our class participants then gets a rabbit to actually process under our supervision. So we help them uh, dispatch using cervical dislocation. And then uh, we go through the whole uh, skinning and evisceration. And then if they want to, we can part and show them how to part it out. And then we prepare it for, for freezing when they get home. Uh, clean up, have a little question and answer session, and then, you know, that's it. Uh, but it's a, it's an eight hour class. We, we love to teach it. Uh, I've done it at people's homes. Uh, I've done it for small communities and we do it at the, at the home centers of America conference. That's, uh, that's, that's fascinating. That's, that's really, really cool. I, I that's amazing. <laughs> um, it just, it blows my mind that you, you could, uh, actually be able to sit down with people and, and help them, uh, dress out their own own rabbit that you gave them but uh. well you know and and like i said that's that's our main focus with our homestead is is to try to help educate you know i'm trying to bring uh, a term back into the uh, the american lexicon uh, and that's cuniculture have you heard that word before i don't believe so you don't believe so you know most people in this country haven't there was a it's a a word and a practice that kind of fell out in the the 1950s uh when meat rabbits became um less of the darlings of the United States kitchen. Uh, and, and cuniculture, it's a, a word that has a, the, the root word is, is, is cuny, which is a Latin word for burrow, which is what they would call a rabbit. A rabbit was called a cuny. Uh, it was named after the burrows that they would make. And there's actually an old English word that you've probably heard growing up in New York. Uh, cony, have you heard that word before? Uh, like Coney uh, Island, yeah, 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 or the Coney Dog here in, in the Detroit yeah, okay. area. Coney dogs are ubiquitous, right? Well, the term Coney was actually an old English word that referred to rabbit. It was a, it was what they called rabbits, the Coney. So, uh, in 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 English literature, you might see the word Coney, and they're talking about rabbits. 
Uh, and so we're trying to bring back this word cuniculture. And basically, it's just the, the definition is it's an agricultural practice of breeding and raising domestic rabbits for livestock as uh, for meat, fur, wool, or other byproducts. Uh, and um, I think that if uh, rabbits have kind of gotten... Um, well, they've been humanized, just like a lot of other pets here in the United States. And um, we assign emotion and feelings. I, I blame this on Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, it's all Bugs Bunny's fault. Uh, that, uh, you know, rabbits not seen as, uh, as livestock anymore. And, and it's, it's a big disservice, really, to the, the animal that itself, because it, I think it lessens its value by saying it's just a pet. Um, so that's, that's really our goal is to help people realize the, the potential of, of rabbit uh, within their lives um, the, and the history of the animal. I mean, the, when you look back as far as, you know, why we even have domestic rabbits here in the United States, it was strictly for the purpose of providing meat for some of the first early settlers here in the United States, in, in the North America. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, people weren't, I, I don't imagine people had, uh, or big on pets back then, you know, no, a, no, of course had a not. purpose, you know, it's, exactly. And there's an animal I got to feed. It's got to do something. So, you know, there's even stories that, uh, that they used rabbits. Uh, uh, Christopher Columbus had rabbits on his, uh, boats in order to provide meat to his, uh, crew as they were crossing, uh, across the Atlantic, uh, because they had such a short gestation period and a short growing period. And, you know, they could be fed table scraps as far as, you know, uh, vegetable table scraps and minimal grains, and they still would always produce meat. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so where can people go to, to, if they, if they are curious about this class, they want to learn more about, uh, rabbits that you have or, or what, where can they go? Well, so we are available uh, mostly on Facebook. I, I try to maintain a pretty large presence on social media. Uh, it's 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 has its pluses and it has its minuses because uh, the amount of negative comments that I get on some of my posts sometimes outweigh the positive. Um, but uh, so Facebook, uh, Independence Acres Homestead on Facebook. Uh, we're also on Instagram, and we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, which is fairly simple to find. Um, we do provide uh, vi a full video series on processing rabbits, uh, along with some of the um, history of the raising rabbits in the United States as uh, as meat animals, uh, along with you know just some of the basics as far as you know picking out your breeding stock, um, how to you know uh, arrange and monitor a breeding session to make sure that it was successful. Uh, we just try to you know, tackle all of these these kind of basic topics, um, and you know we also have some gardening and some other some other fun videos on there. But we we our main focus is is going to be rabbits and and trying to just educate you know, those who are willing to, to listen, uh, about the practice of cuniculture. Cool. I will, I will put links to all that stuff in the show notes. Um, and it, uh, yeah, let people, people go find it that way. Um, if they can't Google it themselves. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you look right. up, uh, if you look up meat rabbit history, we, we show up as like the, our, our video on cuniculture history shows up as uh, like the 20th, link or if you click on videos on google it shows up as the very first video so nice yeah i was pretty oh. impressed with that i actually found that out this morning when i was preparing, <laughs> the, uh, preparing for the interview here so i was like oh hey look i'm first on the videos <laughs> oh man all right all right well uh yeah i i appreciate it um you're making me want to go get some rabbits, but uh, I don't know that now is the time. So maybe maybe somebody else out there will go go pick up some rabbits. I hope so. You know, uh, we're we're trying to, you know, let you know just spread that word that you know rabbits rabbits are the other white meat. Yeah, there, I when it when you boil it down, I mean rabbits are chickens. It's 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 rabbits every time. Um, if you look at it me, logically, just, yes, absolutely. But. Uh, you know, it's just not we've, we we have we've become unaccustomed to it. Thank you, Bugs Bunny and Walt Disney, and you know, all the all that. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Um,
Hop, hop, hoppity hop. I love rabbits. Um, they're they're fun. They're uh, they're cuddly. They're tasty and. They're easy to dress, and really, they don't stink a whole lot. They're great for the garden. Um, if you can get rabbits, listen, listen to the man, and uh, get yourself some. They really are. They're they're a great thing to add to the homestead if you haven't already. They are a great source of meat. Um, I know Jeremy had mentioned that he likes to let his does rest some, um, and uh, I've talked to some folks that um, will breed them every every cycle. I think when when I was doing the rabbits. We had uh, Americans. Um, it was about 28 to, to 30 days to kidding. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, you give them a, a week off or whatever, rebreed them and they were ready to go. Um, and it, it, it worked well for us. The, the does, uh, never really seemed to have any problems. And yeah, we had lots of, lots of meat for the freezer. Um, and, uh, and like Jeremy said, it was delicious, delicious meat. Anyway, folks, I I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, Jeremy's a great guy. He's got a lot going on there. And you should really go check out his uh, his Facebook page. Um, Follow him. Check out the the thing. They have lots of of amusing things in their their store. Lots of little uh, funny sayings, funny shirts, stuff like that. And I will post a link to some of those in the the show notes as well. Um, What what more is there to love about a a rabbit and a hot dog bun on a t-shirt? It's beautiful. Beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Anyway, guys... uh, like I said at the top of the show, if you want to hear hear us talk a little bit about home churching and what that looks like, uh, head over to Patreon, patreon.com slash the Liberty Hippie, and you can find that there. Uh, if that's not up your alley, that's cool too. Go ahead and uh, hit the subscribe button on whatever podcast app listening thing you're using. Hit that subscribe button. Go leave a five-star review anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. Leave them and uh, come back next week. Come back next week and know that know that I love you. Know that I love you. Someone out there loves you. And uh, yeah, get out there, sow those seeds of liberty. We can all reap sheaves of freedom together. Let us dream.